I'm Chad Sanderson. I'm the CEO of Gable.ai, which is a data infrastructure company, um, data management for your data sources. Prior to that, I ran the data platform team at a late stage freight tech startup called Convoy, but I've done all sorts of data roles. I was on the AI platform team at Microsoft, which has gotten a lot more famous over the last eight months or so. But I've also worked at legacy tech com or legacy non-tech companies as well, like Subway and Sephora. Awesome. Caitlin? Yeah. I'm Caitlin Hewden. I'm a data scientist at Figma. I have about 12 years of experience doing data science at different orgs. Um, before Figma, I was principal at Online Meta, where I helped them to build out their analytics function. And before that, I built a lot of predictive models and did a lot of consulting. Amazing. I'm Ben. Uh, I'm one of the founders of a company called Mode. It was a BI tool. Uh, it was acquired by ThoughtSpot, which is another BI tool, uh, where I'm currently the field CTO. Um, I also worked at Microsoft, though, for a company that got acquired into SharePoint, uh, which is a much less cool oh. division than oh. Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> it's still cool. Uh, but it was cool. You could put files on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> like SharePoint. Yeah. They got to go somewhere, you know? Yeah. All right. Um, so why are we here? In general, is this a little pitchy? Is this too close? It's a little pitchy, right? All right. Thank you. Doing my best. Um, all right. So our, our conference is heavily saturated, or this conference in particular is heavily saturated in conversations around technologies, new and emerging, uh, and, and kind of like digging into the nitty gritty of it. Um, but the reality is that there's often kind of like human elements behind that, that just because the technology is cool and amazing doesn't mean you're going to get to success. So what we're talking about today is kind of taking a look at WTF, what WTF are we doing as a data uh, kind of industry? How are we building data cultures, et cetera? So I'm going to kick things off with uh, the question around kind of given the rapid proliferation of tooling, Gen AI, all of that fun stuff, I'm curious, panelists, are we actually closer to having well-functioning data organizations and data teams? Caitlin, I'm going to start with you on that one. Okay. I think it's a mixed bag. So I think with AI, we'll be able to do some things more easily. Like if I can avoid writing for loops, I'm very happy to hand off that part of my work. But we're also um, opening up a lot more roads for people to be building things using AI. And so that means that like having good quality data continues to be very important. Leveling up people on like understanding how to use data, how to ask good questions, how to apply those things also continues to be very important. And I think that's like the hard part of the job. And so we'll still have those things that we'll be working with, um, but we'll also have some parts that will get a lot easier. And so I'm hoping that like actually building out the data quality will be easier, leveraging models, leveraging um, LLMs and that kind of thing. And so I think it's a mixed bag. I'm excited about it. I'm also like, we really have to focus on getting the foundations and the basics right to make everything work. Yeah, I, uh, I, I totally agree with that. I think that I've probably spoken to 2,000 data organizations over the last few years. And what I see in most of them is that there's a lot of excitement about tooling and technology. We want to move to streaming. We want to move to Snowflake. We want to move to DBT. And this is all great, and I'm super supportive of it and very happy for everyone that makes those transitions because it solves problems. But oftentimes, this happens when the actual data foundations themselves are a complete mess. Like, if you actually look at the data, the structure of the data warehouse, the accessibility of the data, where that data is coming from, it's a nightmare. And so it's very scary for me to hear about teams thinking about layering AI on top of an infrastructure that was never designed to scale in the first place or to answer any of the questions that teams now want it to answer. So I think there's a lot of work that still remains to prepare the data in such a way that it can be useful for beyond some very basic, you know, reporting use cases. I have not talked to 2,000 data teams, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you should trust Chad. Uh, but I'm going to say no. Uh, I have a very different take, actually, on the data quality thing that we can get to later, maybe. But on, like, are we closer to where we're going? I think no, because I don't think we know where we're going. Mm -hmm. I think the heart, like, what the, all has happened with AI and kind of with some of the, like, quote, unquote, modern data stack thing, which nobody has said yet at this conference. And, uh, which and seems they, to be like and a, they will yeah, not. Seems they to be a very bad not. word here now. <laughs> is it just uh, over? Is modern data stack done? Is we're in a postmodern era. <laughs> okay. But like, it's not clear what we're trying to accomplish. And I think that, that 
we will figure it out. Like things like AI will be great and all that sort of stuff, and we'll eventually get there, and there'll be lots of great things that come out of it. But right now, it's just like throwing a bunch of tech at stuff and trying to figure out what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that we really figure that out. I don't think AI makes that easier. Yeah. If you just look at like the job titles for data people, it's this enormous mess. There was this thing that lifted a while back where it was like, data analysts are now data scientists, data scientists mm -hmm. are now research scientists. There was some job listing for an analytics researcher on the data science team or something like that. And it's just like, <laughs> what is going on? And I think AI only makes that more confusing because AI is ostensibly a data role. Like we think of AI and data somehow related, but they're not really. Like a lot of the AI practitioners now, to whatever that means, aren't actually data people. They're engineers that are sort of using new ways to build stuff. And so I think it's all this kind of big mess. We're still trying to figure out what we're trying to do. I do think we'll take a bunch of messy pieces and it'll eventually coalesce, not to reference different conferences, but to coalesce <laughs> into something nice. Uh, but I think we're in the just like, this is a, a hodgepodge of things that are still yeah. hard to sort of sort out what's good and what's not. And I think that, I mean, kind of the organizational structure, kind of, you know, how does one company define an analyst versus a data scientist versus blah, 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 blah. Like, that is still so in flux and not nailed down. We have, we as an industry have not rallied around. Like, honestly, I think the closest thing we've gotten to is an analytics engineer because we can point to it and say, well, they use DBT, right? Like, that's kind of the closest that we've gotten. Um, but the reality is, like, it's such a it's such a massive spectrum of responsibilities and roles and skills and all of that fun stuff. Um, and I'm curious, like, do you guys have any kind of like glimmers of hope that companies will like? Are you seeing us rally around other expertise or other I don't know, kind of like those building blocks of a team? Um, because from my perspective, it's like as soon as you throw in AI, anyone can be any one of those things if you put the title on it, right? Mm -hmm. So like, are you seeing any conversations happening or any sort of I don't know, any hope that we're getting closer to those definitions? Uh, also, I know that Ben wants to throw out the term analyst period, so. <laughs> I, not entirely, but uh, for the AI, I think the AI thing, everybody's just gonna attack it all, like suddenly we're all AI people because yeah. that's where the money is. That happened with data science. It's the reason that Lyft changed re analysts to data scientists was like they could pay people more um, or people you know, would, would search for the jobs more. Uh, Lyft probably wasn't excited to pay him more. But um, <laughs> I'm sure that'll happen with AI, where there's a lot of like sort of AI branding because that's what's, what's hot. Um, there's this very obnoxious thing that VCs do when the market turns bad, when they're like, this is the time when real companies get forged. Like, the best companies are born <laughs> in the hottest fires. And you kind of roll your eyes at it. Uh, I do think to some extent that probably happens with the data world now, where the last few years were just like, we have huge conferences where there are big parties and nobody really thinks about tomorrow and now it's like, oh, we gotta really make sure this is worth it mm -hmm. and our bosses are like double checking our expense reports and all those sorts of things. And so I think there's like a lot more, unless you work in AI and then set it on fire, but <laughs> I think there's a lot more like pressure to prove why this is useful. Mm -hmm. And I do think that will, will ultimately be a good thing. It won't be like fun the way that VCs try to pitch it, but I think it'll be useful. I think the strategy becomes even more important and deciding how you're going to, as a business, get value out of your data and then how you're going to do that. Now there are like multiple streams that you can use in order to leverage your data and get value out of it. And so some of those things will go to AI and other practitioners. Some of those things I think will continue to be data and data teams but you're going to have to like resource fight a little bit more um, to ensure that the right problems get routed to the right place, which means like more visibility on the problems and just checking your work on the strategy and making sure that everything is allocated in the way it needs to be allocated and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with Ben's point. I think that the low interest rate environment has created a situation where teams made huge investments into their data organizations without mm -hmm. really knowing why. Mm -hmm where they would pay hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars to Snowflake. They'd pay an enormous amount for data engineers and analytics engineers, a huge amount to like Looker or some other dashboarding tool. <laughs> um, some of them are worth it. Some of them are worth it, <laughs> who knows? Um, but, but I think at the, at the end of the day, it wasn't clear. It, a lot of this was built off of hopes and dreams and, and promises. Right? We're making this investment because, of course, the data will be useful, mm -hmm. and we will figure out what that utility mm -hmm. is after six months or a year or, or two years and three years. And what people are finding after they've made all of that investment is that business value doesn't materialize from the ether. 
Um, back in the 80s and 90s, when storage and compute were tightly coupled and this concept of the cloud didn't exist yet, companies actually had to be really thoughtful in what data they brought into their ecosystem and how they architected their data in the data model that they created. And that had to serve some use case. Mm -hmm. So Ford, a uh, very famous situation where they were switching to, I, I believe it was the Kaizen model, sort of the Japanese like manufacturing mm -hmm. model. And they set up a data warehouse for the explicit purpose of gaining observability into their manufacturing process to identify bottlenecks. And they saved $1 billion doing that. And that was the intent from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And that was what most companies that were investing very heavily into data were doing. They weren't just throwing data from into a data lake and hoping that cool machine learning came out of it. Like they were very, very explicit from bottom to top. Mm -hmm. And I think that what the modern data stack has done, unfortunately, is that it's made it so easy and so cheap to store data and to move it around and to access it and transform it. The cost of building a data infrastructure has decreased, but the thought process of like, how are we going to use this and what value we're going to, are, are we going to get out of it has, has virtually gone away. Mm -hmm. um, and that's resulted in, in massive bills that are not particularly useful. Would you refer to it as a Ponzi scheme? <laughs> um, that's a very strong word. Um, maybe. But, I wouldn't. One, one other thing, as, since we're in Austin, uh, one other like semi-related thing I do think that also affects this is there is at least in Silicon Valley somewhat of like an Elon Musk effect, where Elon Musk fired all of Twitter and the thing didn't immediately shut down, mm -hmm. and so all of like Silicon Valley VC types are also like, why don't you do that? Um, and so it's partly an interest rate thing, but there is also now, a, if you like talk to Silicon Valley companies, a lot of pressure around if this can happen at Twitter, X, whatever, like this is something that a lot of companies are trying to do. There's a much sort of leaner mentality around, around how to build out startups, and data teams are one of the people that are, that are kind of on the chopping block for like how do we stay lean. It feels like AI might be a faster path to get to the like find out stage of things. And so if people are able to use tools where they're like accessing data like themselves and answering their own questions and realizing that things aren't working in the way they wanted them to work, I think there is kind of this understanding of like the importance of data quality that hopefully translates mm -hmm. through that, like as people have more access to tools and doing it themselves. Yeah. One of the questions that I like to ask teams that are thinking of investing in data quality or governance is, if a, what is the cost of a single record being wrong? And if you can't identify that cost, if you don't know, then there's a real question of if you should be investing in data quality or data governance at all, right? It shouldn't be theoretical. Like if the mm -hmm. data is wrong, what is it costing our business? And it might be, well, our CEO has a dashboard and if 30% of the data that flows into that dashboard is incorrect every single day, then we could be making some very public facing uh, incorrect decisions and that could lower our stock price by 15%. Well, there's a clear dollar value that you can attach to that. Or if you've got a machine learning model, you could say, well, if, if I have to throw out a single record because of a null value, then that's going to decrease the accuracy of our model. And if I have to throw out a thousand records, that's going to decrease the accuracy and that has a dollar amount as well. I think a lot of companies don't sort of operate, or a lot of data teams, I should say, don't operate on that ROI based evaluation of their data infrastructure. And so when they go to their leadership and they say, hey, I want more resources to invest in data quality or data governance, and leadership says, why? Why should I give you a million dollars versus give it to my sales team or marketing team who mm -hmm. I know can go out and sell my product for X percent margin? Data teams don't have a great answer for that. So I think that's, um, I want to segue into kind of like the, the other part of this is kind of looking at kind of like why, how and why companies fail to rally around around data, either data tooling, data, you know, kind of like building that data culture. And Chad, I know one thing that you talk about um, quite prolifically, or I don't know if that's the right word, but frequently is kind of tying your data strategy to revenue streams. And so I'm curious, like Caitlin or Ben, if you guys have any, um, not to over stuff that, you know, we can get back to it. But I think, like, do you guys have any other ideas or, or like, are you seeing companies succeed and or fail um, with their strategy? And, and do you have any ideas of, like, why that's happening? You actually have to do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hard because it's... Um, it's different levels of difficulty depending on where you are in the business and how close you sit to revenue. 
And so um, for growth, for example, they can size out, like here's what we need to hit um, at X in order to get to Y. And so here are the projects that we can do and like the expected ROI. I work on the product side of things and those relationships are not always as clear or as mapped. And to get to that mapping and that clarity, you have to have like a certain level of investment and maturity and understanding that I think is inherently like a bit more difficult because it's a few steps removed. And so I think taking some of your resources and investing the time into figuring out the strategy bit and like how do you connect your data and your levers to your business model and to ROI is super important alongside the like day to day of supporting product teams if you're in a product org and helping to make decisions. And so it can't be just like we're enabling good decisions and we trust that that's going to continue to work and that's going to do good things for the business. There has to be this like level understanding of here is what our levers are worth, here is how much we should be investing into them in the future. But that's also, there's like a cart and horse thing, like mm -hmm. understanding the cost of an incorrect record is so difficult if you're at like an early stage startup and you're just kind of trying to like keep the fire hose under control. And so, yeah, I think it's really a difficult problem. I have like a theory on this that I don't know if I believe in, but I'm going to go with it for this. Um, so. <laughs> Okay, so, so like data teams, one of the things that everybody says a data team is for is for making decisions. Right? Like that's kind of the stock answer is why are we here? Help people make better decisions. Great. Sounds good. Um, we don't really talk about the mechanic through which we typically do that. Uh, though a lot of times it's like actionable insight is kind of the easy term where it's like, all right, what do you imagine that being is like, I'm going to go look at some data. I'm going to figure something out. And I'm going to be like, it turns out we're selling shirts in California, but only people in New York want shirts. We need to sell more shirts in New York. And the CEO is like, ah. And now you sell shirts in New York and you're rich or whatever. I don't really think that's how much of this stuff happens. Like one, that stuff is really hard to find. Mm -hmm. And two, unless you find something super obvious, you're typically trying to kind of convince people on the margin. You're trying to like tell the CEO, I think you'll make a tiny bit more money by taking this risky thing of no longer selling shirts in California, but in New York. And the CEO is like, nah, but we've always sold them in California. We're not going to do that. And so you don't really get anywhere. And I think the way that people actually make decisions is they have these sort of models of how the world works. They have a bunch of facts in their head about what's going on. They assume things like, we can't do events because they're not useful. Like there is something, an executive one time had a conversation with a customer that told him one thing or her one thing, and now this is a permanent fact in their head for the rest of the time, and like that's how the business is run, is based on these facts. And some of them are ground in like real sort of scientific-ish truth, and some of them are ground on a rumor, and some of them are, are like, they come from all different places. But ultimately, I think the thing that data teams is most useful is they present those facts to people. They tell people the way the world really works. And I think that's a slight change from thinking about like data as being, I need to find an actionable insight. In a lot of cases, it's not actually actionable immediately. The point is, it's an informative thing that now when you're making a decision, you have kind of a model of, of the way things work that is instructive to what leads into that decision. Mm. And so it can be very stupid where it's like, we sold a B2B tool, people didn't use it on the weekend. We had this assumption that people do not use this on the weekends. We should never send emails on the weekends. There's no reason to ever do that. It was an assumption that we had that was right, but like that was a pretty important thing for us to understand for a ton of decisions. Mm -hmm. That was a lot more important than these sort of marginal things that we think we're chasing. And so I think a lot of it can just be kind of fact finding and model building of sorts of like how the business actually works. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know what the question was. <laughs> I think that was a very eloquent answer. Um, <laughs> to a question that may have to, been asked. There was a question. Yeah. There was yeah. an answer there. Um, I, I actually, um, I, I think what, what Caitlin said earlier actually really hit the nail on the head in, in two different ways. Um, one thing that she said was that um, startups have a really hard time quantifying the value of data and especially something like data quality and data governance. I completely agree with this. And it makes sense, I think, when you sort of imagine what the primary focus of a startup actually is in their existence, um, it's to find product market fit. They are struggling to survive as a company. And data is usually a support function to that mission, mm -hmm. right? It's not that the data itself is generating a tremendous amount of value to the business yet. It's that, well, maybe we can find some useful information or there's some interesting insight like sort of Ben was mentioning that can help guide our framing of a problem. Um, and that is really challenging to put a, to, to put a number on. Um, and the second thing that you said that uh, I, I totally agree with was that it's very hard to quantify this within the scope of, of product, like the product mm -hmm. sort of 
category of a company. I think, and this might be a bit of a hot take, that if you were to create a hierarchy of all the use cases for data in a company, product would probably be at the bottom in terms of value to the business, mm -hmm. right? And that's because mm -hmm. A, it's usually tied more to that support function. Whereas if you talk to finance or logistics or HR or a variety of other business functions who use data every single day, these are like unbelievably important use cases. I remember when I was at Convoy, uh, my team was, which was the data platform team and data engineering rolled up to us. We spent a tremendous amount of time helping the finance team on invoice reconciliation. And they were willing to pay almost any amount of money to solve that data problem because it had massive implications for our customers. And I find that, again, you know, 2,000 2000 businesses, I'm not going to brag or anything like that. <laughs> but so many of these people, so many of these like data engineering and data platform teams are completely neglecting everybody in the company uh, that actually has a use case, a real uh, important use case for data. They're not talking to finance at all. It's like, oh, you guys have a little separate Snowflake instance. Mm -hmm. You can do what you want. You can set up what you want. We're not even going to communicate with you. We're going to build pipelines for the product team who's only using data for dashboards. And then you wonder why everybody gets fired when like, the business doesn't go very well. So I, I, think, I think that like, if, if, if I wanted to impart anyone, anything to anyone here, it's that go beyond the boundaries of, of product. Okay. You're extreme, you're, you're, it is a massive self-limitation to only focus on um, enabling um, like dashboarding for feature discovery. I think there's so many other interesting use cases out there. I think. I was going to just say, but yeah, but invoice reconciliation sounds boring. <laughs> <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> What are we doing here? I don't want to do that. That's, that's why it's called fun employment. <laughs> there's, there's also... Well, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> there's stuff that's foundational and like a must-do, and I feel like that falls into the must-do category. Mm -hmm. And it's also kind of a separation between data and analytics, because I don't see that as like intense analytics work. It's like data engineering yes. pipeline yeah. work to make sure that everything is working, everything is flowing in the right way, the data is correct when it comes to payments, which is so important. Um, I do think that analytics on the product side can be transformational, but then you kind of enter into this thing where you're like, if we find the right thing, and that's the hard part, is like knowing where to tap to find the oil is like the trickiest part yeah. of that. And so you have to have a strategy around it. You can't just say like, we're all trailblazers. We're all going to walk this land and try to find what we can naturally. Like it doesn't work. You have to make sure that you have a strategy before you're even like putting people into that scenario or putting them on that journey. Yeah, yeah, I, I, think, I think you're totally right, um, especially when it comes to data science and AI, where I believe that there is real opportunity for product teams to start to use data as like a production grade ROI generating use case. Um, folks are getting there. In fact, the, I, I was giving this metaphor sort of earlier today. I think a, a lot of what you're describing of like discovering the data that is has like a lot of utility and can make money is, is a skill. Um, it's like being a researcher. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I like to imagine sort of your data ecosystem as a library. And if it's very well structured, and if you follow the Dewey Decimal System, mm -hmm. and if you can actually access that data and find exactly what you need when you need it, and it's all clearly categorized, then that's great. And you'll be able to use, there's still the hard work of actually mm -hmm. doing the research. Mm -hmm. But I find that if you actually looked at most data ecosystems and data infrastructure, it would be like walking into a library where there's nothing has an order, there's no <laughs> labels, there's no author, and there's no librarians, and then expecting the teams to be able to effectively do their jobs and do great research. And I think that that's probably an impossible task, and that's what leads to the perception of a lot of these uh, you know, data scientists wasting their lives on validation and not being able to deliver value. All right, we are moving into our final five minutes. Um, I'm so I'm going to hold off on questions just because I'm sure you all have a lot of questions. We have office hours immediately after this, right across the hall in 116. Um, so in in lieu of kind of doing some shorter questions here, I'd love for um, each of you to I don't know, give some ideas of where do we go from here, right? Like everything's on AI fire. Uh, our roles definitions don't exist. So what, are, what the fuck are we going to do? <laughs> 
I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it starts with B.I. Um, <laughs> I knew it. It's <laughs> great dashboard. Uh, uh, no, I, so I think like, I, so we hadn't really talked about the AI stuff. I think AI does have some, some pretty interesting things that we can do, though I think it'll look pretty different. Um, like one of the things actually to me that's interesting uh, about data quality. So Chad uh, talked a lot about, a lot about data quality. Um, I think the interesting question about AI is like, does it make data quality irrelevant? Like there's a lot of things where we say, okay, to make AI good, you've got to have high quality data. And like it kind of, yes, yeah, sounds like a kind of sensible thing. But if you think about how, say, LLMs work, which LLMs and data, like structured data don't quite make sense. But like if you think about how LLMs work, they actually have very low quality data in them. Like it's Reddit, like my God, can you think of a worse <laughs> data source? Um, and yeah, and yes, they hallucinate in the sense that that is like sort of part of the point of the thing. It's supposed to be a little bit creative. Like hallucin there's a, some Twitter thread somewhere like hallucination is kind of the feature. Like it's not really a bug, it's sort of a feature. Um, like it's supposed to be something that is generative and kind of figuring things out. But the point is it takes all of these really, really messy input data sources. And basically people just scraped it and said, here is a ton of text. It's really disorganized. Learn from it. And essentially, you can imagine like what an LLM does is it reads all this stuff and is like, eh, I'm going to kind of mimic all of that. And I think if it sort of sort of sands out the data quality differences, it's not something that you need to give it high quality inputs. Some high quality things you can't give it, like like Finnegan's Wake or whatever that James Joyce book is. It's not even in English, um, but you can give it stuff that's pretty bad. I think like in some ways, if you think about AI being applied to structured data, which again doesn't quite make sense, but if you get there, a lot of the oh this this particular log is wrong, this thing is wrong. It becomes sort of a thing that you can imagine saying, as a robot, watch all of our users use everything. We have these logs, they're not quite perfect, but just like watch them and tell me what you see. Mm -hmm. And like data quality doesn't really matter that much there. If we don't use it for things like reporting, which yes, okay, don't go tell the SEC something that you sort of made up. Mm -hmm. But if we use it for like finding interesting things, suddenly data quality is like, kind of doesn't matter. The, the idea of us just stuffing data somewhere and having a structured data LLM-like thing, which there are people who are starting to build versions of, finding interesting things in that starts to make some sense in a way where we can actually bypass a lot of these sort of prerequisites that we've long had before about data quality it has to be really good. You have to understand what it means. It's just like, nah, just feed it a bunch of stuff and sort of like tell me what's interesting that you see. They actually do a decent job of that. Yeah. So I also, I, just to kind of expand on that, and I know I'm not a panelist here, but um, I'm going to jump in anyway. Um, I do wonder if it's something where, like what I've seen in kind of the data quality space is, is this um, over-indexing on trying to hit, you know, 80%, 100% accuracy on 100% of your data assets. And the reality is that's a tremendous amount of work and the payoff just isn't there. And so what I wonder is within that, if we can also take the approach of, tell us where there is data quality issues on things that are actually important to the user, to the business, to yes. the product, and to really hone in on what you prioritize to hit that 100% quality mark. Because otherwise, we're just in this kind of like forever uh, rapidly moving treadmill of data quality shit to do. And it's like, does at the end of the day, let's like prioritize the things that are actually impactful. Anyway, Caitlin, I'd love your, your idea of, I don't know, where do we go next? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think it's a hard question. Um, I'm bullish on AI and LLM to help us do our jobs better. How it will fundamentally change data orgs is the thing that I'm trying to be the most like open-minded about and intake and learn more about. Um, I do feel like it's going to be different. So if you have something that can just be constantly monitoring and like making its own conclusions and you can ask it questions and take some of like the lower stakes, easier work, um, it frees us up for more interesting things, but I'm really interested in like where that bar is and how many higher level questions we have, how we prioritize those, how we, how we think through those. And so I just come back to strategy and how important it's going to be to understand like the data you have, the questions you're asking, the right route to get them answered and the right route to like invest and actually build out um, pipelines and things that make sense given the data that you have. Um, so I don't have a great answer. I don't have like a clean wrap. Yeah. I think it's all just stuff that I'm really thinking about and I'm thinking about in terms of like the next generation of data scientists. Like it's changed so much in the past like 12 years that I've been in the field. Mm -hmm. And so I expect it's going to change very rapidly and I'm just following it really closely. Cool. You wanna take us home? 
Sure. Um, I would love to spend the next five minutes addressing the data quality points that you guys <laughs> made, but uh, I'm not going to do that <laughs> because uh, then uh, we'll be over 10 minutes instead of five. Um, but uh, so one of, one of my favorite authors uh, that maybe a lot of you folks have read is a, a statistician named Nassim Taleb. He wrote uh, Black Swan and a bunch of other sort of really interesting uh, philosophical books. And um, one of the, the sort of things he, he talks about is this idea of the, the Lindy effect. And the Lindy effect is sort of this phenomena that's been observed where um, non-material things like uh, ideas or music, um, if, if it existed in the past, right, sort of the longer that it has existed, the longer uh, expected existence it will continue to have. Whereas something that's new effectively has a, a shorter half-life. And I think about that, um, uh, I, that, that's meaningful to me when I think about, well, well where should teams be investing their time? <laughs> Do you want to be investing your time into the new shiny stuff that may or may not exist as a problem in a year from now or three or four or five years from now? Or do you want to spend your time solving the problems that the business had 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago if you're in that, uh, if you're in that type of company? And which one of those types of problems is actually going to make you more important and more essential to the company? Um, what I have seen in my career is that it is generally the latter. And so what that involves is, A, like actually figuring out where in the business could really use uh, data infrastructure and data engineering and data support the most. Like if you can't answer that question, if you can't give 10 use cases of where data would make your business a million dollars or a hundred million dollars, then we probably should go find that out <laughs> and then figure out how we can support those teams and, and enable them to solve those problems. And that might involve going and meeting people that we don't normally talk to within the organization and focusing a little bit less on the cool, interesting technologies and thinking about the boring applications of data that have uh, tremendous utility. So that's me. Like invoice reconciliation. Like invoice reconciliation. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. Thank you all so much for joining. Yeah.